Hello and welcome to the 28th episode of the Mike McNair Revolutionary Strategy Series. Today is Saturday the 26th of October 2019 and I'm your host Tom O'Brien. This week we continue our mega intense reading of Chapter 8, Political Consciousness and Riff Poetical on Historical Materialism and Markov Chains. I have the new patrons Ryan Foulhaber, Mike Richmond, Victor Osprey and Chris and Alex who upped their pledge to thank. You too can help keep the good ship Alpha afloat by joining the Patreon gang gang for as little as $5 a month, which works out at $1 an episode. Patreons get special bonus episodes, the right to vote on the reading group series and other cool stuff too. When we reach 100 patrons, we'll be producing a second patron-only podcast every month. As it's the podcast's first anniversary of being on Patreon, all new patrons for the rest of the month of October will get a free exclusive from Alpha to Omega badge. They are totally like radical and stuff. This week, the latest Patreon-only episode with Jack Conrad of The Weekly Worker was released. It's all about the lessons of 1917. So if you like Soviet political economy, this is the episode for you. If you'd like to comment on the show, please do so on the YouTube channel and make sure to like, subscribe and share. You can also join me on Facebook or Twitter too. Okay, to the discussion. Okay, last week, last week, we got so yeah. pissed off after doing two pages in about nine hours last week <laughs> that we're back to page 143, starting to back to separate national revolutions. The previous parts of this chapter we talked about the international and its symbolic unity then we talked about basically what happened with russia and the failure of the russian russian revolution and trotsky and the communists and today we're back we're starting into the national revolutions so who wants to give this lexi you're always a good reader so why don't you start off here with maybe reading the first couple of paragraphs here and we'll see how we go on the second aspect was a political retreat to the idea of a series of discrete national revolutions. This was a retreat in the first place because, as we saw in chapter four, Lenin and Zinoviev's policy of dual defeatism proposed a struggle by an organized international movement to bring down the belligerent states simultaneously. It was a retreat secondly, because it was quite clear to the Russian leadership that the proletariat could not hope to hold power in Russia for long unless the Western workers movement came to their aid. October 1917 was thus a gamble on the German Revolution. By 1919, with German social democracy in the saddle, this gamble had failed. It was only gradually that the possibility of hanging on and waiting for the Germans year or two was transmuted into the idea of a prolonged period of isolation of the Soviet regime. And from there, in turn, into socialism in one country. In the third place, common turn at the outset and down to 1921, expected a generalized European civil war in the short term. In the civil war in Russia and the 1920 invasion of Poland, the Russian CP had been willing to ride roughshod over national self-determination to carry the arms of the Red Army to the borders of the former Tsarist Empire. In 1920, they hoped to carry them to the eastern border of Germany, ready to intervene if the German communists could provide the causes belly. Only military defeat held them back there and in Finland and the Baltic. By 1921, this policy was effectively over. This fact was signaled both by the retreat in Russia represented by the new economic policy and the turn to the struggle to, quote, win the masses, or urge on the communist parties at the Third Congress. Okay, what do people make of all of that? There's a lot that's glossed over in ways that, if you actually dig into it, I'm not entirely sure it makes us coherent of an argument. So, for example, um, the idea that all this is mainly about a strategic mistake because... Um, only military defeat held them back. Uh, the, NE, the NEP wasn't a result of that military defeat. Um, the NEP was the result of they also couldn't maintain an expansionist war and feed anybody. And also they didn't have their farm modernization work done before they tried to expand. So when, when I critiqued the book earlier for like being overly politically deterministic, this is like one that's like blatantly obvious. I don't know what else the Soviets could have done. 
like one thing I would say is uh, I know we, this is the thing that's come up again and again about the book being kind of highly politically determined. And I know Puya always rattles on about it as well. And I was at the Communist University and I was at a talk. It was actually at a talk by Platypus. And I, I must say it was the worst political talk I've ever been to in my entire life. <laughs> and two thirds of the crowd left by the end of it. It was surprising me, not in the least. Go ahead. Un <laughs> unbelievably painful. But a, a point in it, uh, McNair I, was I, making, I can't remember the specific, God, I'm really annoyed. I can't remember the specific thing. And he, he was, he was, he said a thing, he said a point to the speaker about like, well, actually, you know, I don't think this is a philosophical point. And I said, and I kind of, I kind of interjected. I said, well, do you mean it's like a material point? McNair was like, no, 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 it's a political one. And I can't remember what the goddamn context was, but I was really surprised he said it was political and not material. I think this is, you know, I think that's maybe a critique that I think has, I'm taking more on board about this book that I think it is overly political. It, it shocked me when he said it was a political thing and not a material one. Whatever goddamn hell we're talking about, I can't remember. But I, I just thought I'd throw that in there. Well, what does everybody else think about that? Because I mean, it, it just seems to me like saying, like the, the, he doesn't say it outright, but like doing like close English teacher readings of this book and since we've been on this forever, I'm at that point now. It just does, he strongly implies that the NEP is literally the result of them being militarily defeated in Finland and the Balkans. <laughs> yeah, as opposed to like problems with their internal market and how, you know, grain requisitions was destroying whatever like warmth that they had won among the peasantry in the countryside you know, steal, like, you know, forcing people to give grain was pretty much like liquidated all that goodwill. I mean, and they had yeah. to introduce a market or else they would have, you know, basically had to been fending off waves of waves of attempted third Russian revolution. I agree with what you're, y'all are saying, but doesn't he also talk about, or maybe this is something I was talking about with Lexi, but doesn't he also somewhere bring up uh, the idea of like the NEP as like a controlled retreat to capitalism? Or am I? Am I being mistaken that with the conversation I had with Lexi? I, I, I would. I think I would probably characterize like the, the way that left comms looked at um looked at the NEP, you know. Gotcha. And most people tended to think of the NEP as you know, if you were like a hard like left communist that that wasn't anti Bolshevik, you usually look at the NEP as well. They threw in the towel instead of trying some alternative to markets, no matter how absolutely brutal. Um, they're just going to fall back on trying to make some kind of market work. Right. And it, um, it is, yeah. Well, I don't so, see how they so, could have not fallen back on markets. Yep. Yeah, but yeah. The, Mar the Marxist humanists and the left comms think that anytime you fall back on Marxists, you've made a strategic concession to to value and thus capital. Well, well like, I mean, like, is that like, even wrong? Like, things are pretty fucked by the time they're getting to the NEP right. IMHO. This is actually one part of the the history here where I am I am a, quite in the dark. Like what was the logic behind military expansionism on the back of like a failing material base? Like did, was did, it was it literally just like we're going to plunder the borderlands and then that will save us? No, it was that Russia would have the productive capacity that they, and not Russia, that Germany would have the productive capacity that Russia didn't have. And I mean, they were objectively right about that. It, like, yeah. it, so like if, if, if Germany could have got, could have gotten there and they could get the cost belly with, with internal supports for the war, then they could have, uh, you know, according to this idea, which was um, they could have had enough to actually produce and modernize the the Russian agricultural economy very quickly, with, because they would have had the knowledge sets from the Germans, and right. and maybe you know all this would not happen. But there's a thousand assumptions built into that. One of which, frankly, has always has always baffled me. Isn't like it ties into my why don't we ever discuss the fact that all this happened in the context of of world wars? The context for the Bolsheviks is that they were actually being used as a pawn by both the Germans and the fucking English at different points to um, to try to help our hurt Russia from the front. So, like, mm. and they just didn't put that into their own calculations about the international powers. And it really does seem to be that 
that simple. And also, when people like McNair write about this, they also don't put the international powers into the consideration. You don't hear about what England and 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 um, the United States are doing. This is this also led to like a lot of bad assumptions on uh, on on Soviet on Sovietologist part because they took Hilferding um, so seriously because they just didn't study the English and American economies at all. And also what they were capable of. So, and when you when you read about this, you think like, oh yeah, we 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 get Germany, and then magically this all works. And they're not entirely wrong on productive capacity, but they're forgetting the rest of the goddamn world still exists. And I, I, and and yeah. most Soviet historiography is written this way. But uh, I don't think the I think he's kind of misplacing his he might be misplacing his hope in Germany because even after Russia developed its productive capacity or the Soviet Union developed its productive cap- capacity in isolation, it didn't lead to, you know, an exporting of the, you know, it didn't lead to world socialism. I think what what basically Derek is getting at is that in order to have a chance and a chance where they're not some like isolated, atar- you know, a- oligarchical party dictatorship, they needed the they needed the help of a more advanced economy and Germany seemed the most likely candidate as well as one of the most advanced economies in the world at the time. Right. But they didn't occur to them to even like try to work with the other advanced economic, like the idea of, for example, the Russians appealing to, I don't know, a French socialist revolution or an American socialist revolution never even came up. Yeah, that is, that is weird. Yeah. And it, well, I have to say too, though, like it feels like the only point that this, that these kind of dynamics are even like touched on in this book. And I could be mistaken, but later on in the chapter, McNair talks about how Marx was mistaken in thinking that if you could take out the uh, czar, you would have like a wave of revolutions going from east to west. And it was really Britain's uh, containment and Britain's money that made uh, Russia, gave Russia the ability to stop. Yeah, the uh, revolutions of 1848. I think that's really the only time that these dynamics are talked about. But as far as like positive strategy of like the U.S. or or France or some other uh, country to go socialist, like yeah, it's never really talked touched upon anywhere yeah. that I've seen. Well, and and, and he, Berlin is the old Moscow, right? They're importing a lot of their tactics from the German workers' movement. The German workers' movement is considered, you know, the most advanced, right? The, I mean, really, the import of this is that the Russian Revolution, from a Marxist framework, from Marx's framework or an elaborated version, d- doesn't make any sense without without connecting to where capitalism is more developed. It just, but, it, like it doesn't. But Germany, like, it's always interesting to me that they were assumed that Germany was going to be the the stronghold because it was the, right. it it was a, it was a new nation, an extremely new nation. It was super developed and super efficient. Now, its efficiency was actually interesting because it didn't have imperial sprawl. Right? So maybe that's part of the logic. But I never actually saw that articulated in any of this classical literature as to being why. And the idea of appealing to, like, the national revolutions and all that were always encouraged, at, you know, including the quote-unquote, you know, developing world ones. But um, the idea of really appealing to that and to, like, like highly developed, other highly developed capitalist societies, it never occurred to them. And it also really, honestly, and this goes back to Marx and Engels, who just thought the English were dumb. Um, <laughs> I mean, I'm serious. I mean, uh, so so <laughs> so, no, it's so real. Like, yeah. the, like it's there's every word about the English drips with contempt. Have you seen Boris Johnson? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> True. the prime minister. Oof. But like, but I think a lot of it though, as well, is to do with geographical area, like. Germany is the big power close to them. It's not like if there was a revolution in Spain or something that they would be able to link to them to the same extent as Germany. I just think that has also got to do with it. But also, Germany wouldn't have been as developed as the UK at that time. No? They had, no, 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 no. We were, the point Derek's making. The thing was that they were leapfrogging the British economy at this point. Like they, they were the leader, the world leader in chemistry. And that was like enormously important and germany at this point had already become sort of like the world intellectual center in terms of higher education like there was a lot of potential there in terms of technological development but that you know what they underestimated the entire time was that all this was predicated on and including the technological development was predicated on german nationalism the bismarckian state had invested tons of money to build that um, intellectual artifice up because it didn't have the imperial industries 
Like, and it could, and it realized, and you know, like late late Bismarckian state policy actually realized that. And so it just is it kind of amazing to me. The more I read, like all these socialist historiographies and histories of this, that most of them do not actually go into what actually happened in Germany prior. Um, even though the SPD was super huge, but it was the nationalism crescent that split the SPD. It was the nationalism crescent that led to led a faction of the right wing of the XPD, and I don't want to like say all of it because that's not true, to become to become a core of people that would even support the goddamn Fry Corps. This was just missed, and it's still missed. And if you don't talk about that, and you just see this as oh, it's rush, you know, it's it's Lenin's failure because I guess they should have fought harder in the Baltics or something. I mean, I'm not saying that's what he's saying, but it kind of is what he's saying. Like, he just says, like, the only reason they didn't do this was military defeat. You know who talks about that? Mike Duncan. When he goes into the revolutions of 1848 and the attempt at at German unification from liberals, it failed. And he basically kind of spills the tea and says, ultimately, it's the conservatives and kind of neo-absolutism that succeeds and German unification. Right. And I think that kind of, it, it, it feels like that kind of poisoned the well a little bit with German politics, because as you said, like even the German SPD, a good chunk enough of a chunk of the right wing of it were loyal to that state. And that state was founded on very conservative principles. Right. I mean, well, you have to, like, if you look at, for example, the membership of the of the SPD, the leadership was a lot of the old leadership was Jewish, but be, believe it or not, like a lot of the a lot of the Jewish community did not form the core of the um, of the SPD membership in the way it did in say Russia, all right, which led to a lot of this weirdo Judeo Bolshevik conspiracies. But one of the reasons why is German unification, as absolutist as it was, was seen as being friendly to multi ethnic, you know, uh, right, and so like. And and it was actually weirdly like the left nationalists who who became the the most virulently anti-Semitic uh, is a la Wagner. Right. I mean, and I think um, I think it's interesting because I think Bismarck. This is kind of getting way off topic, but Bismarck was like a, a brilliant politician for all of his flaws, and probably saw how poorly it went for Hungary when they were trying to have their uh, national revolution and they kept, there was like a faction that just kept shitting on all the ethnic minorities. And that really came to bite them in the ass in a big way. Yeah. I mean, and so, um, I mean, and honestly, that was also the model I think for Lenin's national policy, frankly, but like, you kind of have, my, my, to, be, you have right. to be multi-ethnic or you're going to get fucked. Well, yeah, but Lenin's, Lenin's, Lenin's national policy also leads to mass and ethnic sorting. And that doesn't go well and leads to micro-nationalism, Stalin, Right. Like replaces it with Russification. The, the reason why I'm going through all this, though, is like there's reasons for all this that have nothing to do with the fact that they just failed in Finland. Like this is a much larger problem. And I realize, yes, this is three paragraphs, but like you're going to talk about like literally like this three these three years are the years that are the most contested in communist history as to why things went wrong between between 1918 and 19. 19- 21. Like you can literally pick your weird trot and left com and Marxist humanist sect about what thing that happened in these years is the reason why the revolution failed or whatever, or state capitalism emerged or, or what the non motor production or whatever you want to explain it by. But it's always in the contested grounds of 1918, 19, 19, 19, 20, 19, 21. Like that's it. That's where it happens because that's when the NEP emerges. That's when they. That's when Finland like goes belly up and Poland doesn't go well. And I just bring this up because the idea that this is solely a political problem just seems laughable to me. Agreed. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but it, it, st- it, it's so much more complex. Yeah, I'm still curious, like where this confidence in Germany is coming from. Like, why is he so sure that if Germany uh, because Lenin was red, so sure of that, though, that was Lenin's assumption too. Well, yeah, I don't think I know. basically, like, like basically, I, without that, the Russian Revolution was a mistake. That's why. No, but I mean, like, I feel like he's just adopting like Marxistisms. Well, I think it it, it <laughs> is true that. Um, before 1914, the German SPD in Germany in general was like the, that was a Moscow of that time. That was like the cent- the historic center of communism was Germany. Berlin was Moscow at that time. You combine that with the fact that German is an, you know, an advanced economic power. They're relatively geographically close. 
like Derek is is correct in that they should have had multiple. They should have had a plan B and possibly a plan C instead of just like going, "Oh, no, Germany. Guess we're fucked." You know, like there could have been other options. You know, but they they were kind of they were too attached to Germany. I agree with that. But I think w- one thing I often like kind of picture in my head is they aren't like it's going to be difficult to get to other parts of the world, whereas Germany is like super close and it's not like these capitalist countries are just going to let them get on through. You know what I mean? And so that could actually trigger another war if say like France went communist, right? And then they had to like trade and link up and these capitalist powers are blockading them. Like, and it might not have necessarily led to war because people were pretty war weary at the time. But I, I think a lot of the capitalist powers were probably willing to risk pissing off their citizens and to stop these communists. You know what I mean? Well, they're definitely they willing to risk fascist takeover twenty years later. So, right, I think they're willing to they're willing to do a lot of things to stop this. So, there was a proposed alternate um, kind of coalition, which was uh, the idea of a revolution of the peoples of the East. You know that. Yeah, that's true. And maybe that there could be some kind of you know blocking up that would uh, geopolitically, you know allow them to do like a greater so this is at this point though essentially a greater version of like socialist industrialization and i think if marxist theory has a leg to stand on with regards to the history of the soviet union if historical materialism and that whole way of seeing the world has anything to say about it it would probably be that you can't industrialize with the same regime that you know brings about communism but those two things are just two different <laughs> types of tasks and one of them requires like class society which means plan b also would have would have also like probably failed probably yes because i mean well because also it happened let's talk about plan b i mean that's that that is essentially what happened in the 1940s and it went not very well (laughs) like and and when i say it went not very well i mean there was immediately there was immediate ethno tensions immediate ethno tensions it the 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 situation of industrializing china outside of of hong kong which they didn't even get shanghai and um, beijing was a much bigger problem and was not completed until the middle of the goddamn 1980s I mean, actually, arguably, it's still not done. I mean, they're, well, they're, they're still building an ex- yeah, like those, those are <laughs> real, China's urbanization is like insane when you look at the t- statistics. It's it's wild. It's still happening, um, right? And, and they still maintain the internal passport system to control it. I mean, like, and yeah, like, right. look, they have to. I mean, like, I'm, I don't want to sound like a China apologist because I'm not, but they have to. The 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 issue that I just have is like, how how could you, if if we thought. Like if you take Marx's stages seriously, all right, and and, and I I want to call out that no one actually does. Left comms don't either because they actually reject the like transitional period of the critique of the Bertha program. Like nobody actually takes, maybe not all left comms, but most of them do. Nobody actually takes Marx's stages seriously because like if you don't get Germany and you don't get England and you don't get the United States and you don't get France. From Marxist perspective, you don't have enough of the core of the bourgeois world to build socialism off of. And when he wrote about Russia, he did write about the possibility of, of the revolutions moving east. But he also wrote that like their mode of production was radically different. They may not have to go through capitalist development middle period, but it wouldn't be the same thing. Like yeah. that's that's what that letter to Virgil like, says. Right. Like it, it would be industrialization mm-hmm. as it as it happened in Russia. Right. You know, he actually thought maybe the peasant, the peasants' communes would be a good grounds for the workers' committees, which he wasn't, they were not wrong about. And then the, the development elsewhere could really help, and so that they might get to skip capitalism, but only because that you know the other, some of the other capitalist societies would be socialist by that point. One would think. I mean, he doesn't explicitly say that. But that's the only way that logic really works. He does say he does say like this could happen under this condition. So he he makes the logic explicit, but he doesn't go deep into it. Right, because it was like a runoff letter that he like revised three times. It wasn't it wasn't like a treatise or anything. So like the argument is there though. Right, and then okay, so let, let's let's like let, we're, we're let's actually get to what the Westerns did. Do you want me to read this, Tom? Yeah. Before that, I, I want to say something. Uh, it's like um, anybody remember that Meatloaf song? Uh, I do anything for love, but I won't do that. What would the, the capitalist one? version be? I do anything for capitalism, but I won't do fascism. Well, they fucked that one up. 
What, yeah. what, what would they not do? What would the capitalists not do in that scenario? Yeah, hell, I think they may even become communists and said capitalism, for fuck's sake. I don't even know. <laughs> oh, Hegelian. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right. Derek, hit that text there. Uh, wait, are, were we talking about like Marx's like stage? Like you have to go to feudalism and then capitalism. Well, and sort of. I mean, I think Marx didn't yeah. actually think you had to go through each one of them, but he did think that socialism was only possible not to be not being primitive communism. Like the difference between it and primitive communism is that you're developed enough to have an advanced like advanced technology, basically. Like, like advanced technology from the from from the standpoint of the early industrial revolution, not from ours. Yeah, but yeah, like, but I, I don't really, I don't really think that there's like two things. Like, I don't think, really think that Germany was had the technology to organize the economy, even though it's political. Like, the political position of the Soviets might be better because you know on an international scale or whatever. The second thing is like, I think like a better version of historical materialism. Like, I saw. Uh, I saw this on like Cockshot's blog and he like made this Markov diagram, you know, a transition diagram in like a Markov chain. Yeah, he like made this transition diagram of in like a, of like a Markov chain. There were like um probabilities like between from switching from one mode of production to another. Like there's a certain probability of going from, you know, capitalism to socialism and socialism. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, he tried yeah. to make off a probabilist logic as opposed to Hegelian logic. Yeah, I feel yeah. like I feel like um it's yeah and then that. and then maybe you can, like how do you is? apply prob like how do you come up with the probability functions to decide what the yeah. probability is? Well, it's kind uh, of it's still another frank typology really. Well, like, I think you could make like a probability function with like, you know, like economic variables and political or, ones or social, you know what I mean? It's like it's like just trying to actually write in a different form to what Marx well, said. I think, what you well, end up well, doing. I think, well, I think you would need to go through the like. Maybe you should like look at some data too, and like see uh, under what conditions you know. What's our uh, sample size? Oh, yeah, come on. What's our sample size? I know, I know. The sample size is very low, but you know, or like very low. maybe you could, maybe it's you like could do more. it. Our sample maybe size you could is like do, two. But also, maybe but, you could just go into like biological research and see like how people respond to certain conditions. Look, I think like, this is like this is a, this is a, I honestly don't think this is a bad idea. It's worth like examining the potential for. But the the thing that I'm kind of afraid of is that it it just discounts human agency. And I think sometimes there are variables that can't be quantified, especially when we're looking at like the way societies are ran. And I feel like that's going to drop that completely. It almost it almost sounds like and I don't think you're intending this, but it almost sounds like structuralist. I just feel like you know, yeah, it's Maybe, one of the things where you can't like um you know I know climate science you you're working <laughs> off uh, only one sample but you can you can look at the system and, and build it up and you can run a huge amount of models on it you know a friend of mine was running a model like some climate model on the the world's second fastest supercomputer and uh, I asked him how is it going and he said oh it's not going too good I go, <laughs> my whole, my whole planet is under 25 feet of water and I can't figure <laughs> out how the fuck it's happening. <laughs> you know? Like, so like, you know, you know, like with one thing, you can model the physical systems of, of the earth. You can actually figure them out and deduce them. I think it's a hell of a lot more nebulous when it comes to social stuff. Maybe I'm wrong. Well, well, you, yeah. you know what? I, Maybe I'm you could do like uh, good, good enough favor. approximations. I'm in favor of trying that. How do you I, know I, that? How do you know? I think, you can't know. I don't think that well, like well, we, uh, have, we have a good enough understand. Honestly, we need to interrogate the categories we're doing this. If you look at Cockshot's paper on that, because I did look at it, socialism and communism are two separate modes of production, for instance, right? Okay, well, we need, you know, we need whatever. To I mean, you have to like square the whole concept of a mode of production with contemporary research like what we actually think about like foraging societies and early horticulture how many mode of productions are there really like i think that yeah, we can like that, categories like, like asiatic despotism aren't going to cut it anymore right yeah, so, like, <laughs> asiatic despotism is big. <laughs> yeah, yeah no sorry for real yeah the, the oriental mode of production ain't gonna cut it or the asiatic mode of production so like no i, yeah. I think that's just uh, pet, like feudalism like it, it, but all i'm saying is that like we need to make this a lot more tractable before we um decide on stuff like that like although i think that once you get like a 
kind of better framework to work with that doing that kind of stuff becomes an option. But honestly, we have such the research program is is in a, is in a pretty rough way. So if you yeah. if you wanted if you wanted to do something that fine grained, you have to do a lot of extra leg work to build. Well, out here's the thing. Yeah, here's but the thing. I, I think we should do it. Let's do it. You, but yeah, but you yeah. run into the problem of interpolation. Like you, yeah. you can get any set of points and 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 find a function that will go through them. But when you change one more, add one more point, the function will be completely different. And it's like, so what will you actually get out of it? You know, to me, it's just one well, of those things. Well, Political action just... is better than actual figuring out something like that, I think. I well, don't know. Unlike, here's the thing, too. Like, unlike academia, well, if this thing falls on its face and doesn't work, we can actually publish that and it can be instructive and we can learn something valuable from it. So I don't think it's like necessarily a waste of time. I just think I do think it's a long shot, but it's a how do you test shot. it? It's a cock shot. No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, 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 the rip. Rip. well, the well, wash is dead. <laughs> I miss well, Kyle. You know, well, maybe you don't have to like uh, use the data points. You can just you know do it theoretically. Uh, uh, I I think that theory. I think that the only thing like out of this this sort of proposal that I find interesting is that it 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 would not treat a transition in the mode of production as a kind of black swan event. It would it would view um, the transition from one mode of production to the other as something that was a lot more likely than that. And I feel like the way we usually think about the transition to communism now is much more as the kind of black swan thing that we we and we're usually reasoning from the Russian case there. Right, like, wow! Look at this incredible, bizarre uh, turn of events that happened in Russia. I guess it's going to be like that. I don't know. Well, maybe changing the way we think about changes in the mode of production could be fruitful in that way. But like, also, Puya, like, think about the butterfly effect. You know? Oh, I think uh, like if system like this, if your data is just slightly off and stuff, you'll just have vastly different solutions. It's just a it's a problem with interpolation. It's, you know, it's just a fundamental core property of these systems. Look at like the game of life or stuff like is it the game of is it not the game of life? Is the game of life those simulations and you just Yeah, it's game of play, life. Yeah, you change basics, one tick, one little box you change at the startup and it goes completely and utterly different. So when you're making these models and you're saying, Well, we could come up with a theory, you know, and it's like, but well, the theory is like it's a stab in the dark. Uh, what what the dynamics are in these things l largely to make the best we can ho hope for is you, you know i think you get more out of thinking through the strategies than you would after building a model and writing writing it in mathematics and then go oh yeah this is the way and that's just that's just totally equivalent to having an argument except well, it looks uh, better well i don't mean like this is the way i mean like you know, you just understand the dy like the dynamics of the system. You know, a way of like grasping, you know, like the like the mechanics of the thing. I know, I do understand you, but it's like we don't have data. We don't have a, a thousand planets with humanoids. You know. Yeah, but I, look I, at I don't think you need data, it. or uh, you might need a little bit of data. You might need. I mean, you can I mean, do. You, you well, can you, you can start from first principles. You have history. I think we uh, should uh, yeah. probably moved on because we're Wait, now, probably we, never we going to agree on this. I'm not okay, high but, enough, guys. But but one more. <laughs> But uh, it would also be good if you like. Uh, I think you would need to also use like the topology of a system, you know, like a spatial statistics type thing. What do you mean? Like you know, we had like stuff happening in uh, Germany, like in uh, Austria, like with the war that was like influencing Russia and like okay, yeah, caused yeah. this change in the mode of production in Russia. Yeah, yeah, it'd have to be spatial. It would have to be spatial. It would have to be. Yeah, yeah. It would have to be everything. It would have to have about five hundred fucking variables. Uh, <laughs> Are we just describing <laughs> Victoria too? Yeah, I, I feel like I feel, has anyone ever read the foundation, oh God. the foundation series? Because I feel like we just went through the foundation That's series. Wrong. All right, what the okay, Russians did? Do it, Derek. Derek, do it. Thanks for thanks for rescuing us, but you're also to blame. Yeah, <laughs> I, I said that in, the, in our private chat as as well. Um, the shift into a policy of separate national revolutions, even if these might turn out to be close together in time, carried with it an increased emphasis on copying the Russian Revolution. The struggle for the Soviets, intervention in bourgeois parliaments, the struggle to win trade unions, the worker-farmer alliance, the Bolshevizing, the organizational forms of the communist parties, the united front, the workers' government, 
the policy of the right of the self-determination of nations and what became the transitional demand. All these were justified primarily on the basis that they were validated by the victory of the Russian Revolution and only secondarily and sketchily on more general theoretical grounds. There was only one example of a successful revolution. Russia and the socialists everywhere had to copy it. If it were not for the immediate context of defeats in Hungary, Germany, and Italy, and the general belief that the revolutionary crisis and civil war were on the agenda in the immediate term in the West, this claim would have already been utterly and would have been utterly extraordinary. Russia was a country in which the proletariat was a small minority. Communication in the Russian countryside was highly patchy, and in many areas, the technology and use in agriculture and the density of the market towns was more comparable to West European 12th century than to the 16th century, let alone the 20th. Trade unions and political parties alike had existed in Russia before the revolution, illeg uh, before the revolution illegally and on a small scale. The German Reichstag, uh, Reichstag had limited powers, but looked more or less like a French or Italian chamber of, uh, of deputies. The Russian Duma was far more limited. There was little reason to suppose that the tactics that had brought down the fragile and not very democratic regime of 1917's provisional governments and the shallowly rooted cadet, Menshevik, and social revolutionary parties would work on a far more deeply entrenched and experienced political parties of Western Europe, the U.S., or even Latin America. And I'm going to pause there and say, like, I don't know that re social revolutionary parties were that shallow. Anyway, picking back up. Imitating the Russians was not utterly disastrous. In the same way, attempts to imitate Maoist and more developed countries were in the 1960s and 70s. This is attributed to the fact that most of what the Russians endeavored to teach the common term in 1920 to 23 was, in fact, Orthodox Kalskyism, which the Russians had learned from the German ass pay day. But there were exceptions. The worker peasant alliance was utterly meaningless in the politics of Western communist parties before 1940, and after 1945 was a force of conservatism as the European bourgeois. Uh, bourgeoisies turn to subsidizing agriculture. The Bolsheviki. Okay, mm -hmm. Derek, let's stop there. There's a load gone there. Yeah, you've done a, a lot of reading there. We'll, cool. Yeah. Should we stop there? Yeah, let's stop. Or we there. want to keep going. Do you want to keep going? No, I'm, I'm down a pound. We could talk. Because I, I think the next thing is a whole can of worms. Yeah. So yeah. Let's, let's stick here. Lexi, mm -hmm. what was that? That sounded like um, that. Has somebody got uh, a trap door? Like, is keeping like a, a sex slave in a trap door? <laughs> that you, Sophie? <laughs> No one hears a Maoist. <laughs> <laughs> oh my yeah. god! Yeah, um, that's, oof, oof. Just Lexi, that's a punch. Yes, hit it there. Do what the Russians did. Let's do what the Russians did. Everyone against the wall. Um. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I think this is straightforwardly true that like. If the Russians weren't the only people to like keep their little revolutionary regime in power, there'd be no a priori reason to like privilege their experience. And the fact that this is the only thing that stuck, it's hard to overstate like how, you know, how much that like deformed revolutionary consciousness. And this is something that was picked up on in the, like at the time um, by actors who were in, involved in these things in the left-wing communism debate by the antagonists of Lenin, not by Lenin. Uh, <laughs> I remember reading, like, I, I remember, you know, being a little baby Leninist and, you know, I had read left-wing communism, but I never read the responses to left-wing communism and what provoked it. And it's um, texts by Gorder and Panacock that are like, dude, you don't know what it's like here. <laughs> like, you know, Marxism supposed to like, you know, dig deep into political economy and stuff. And then, derive, you know, thoughts about society and politics from that political economy. Well, our political economy is like way different. Yeah. Even when I was, you know, trying to defend Leninism, that, that stuff stuck with me because it was things that everyone would always say. If you actually looked at the way people did things, they tried to systematize the experience of the Russian Revolution the same way that, you know, Engels systematized Marx as if it was the same kind of topic. There was a there was a chapter in Japanese communism where or a period in Japanese communism where Japanese communists tried to start a peasant revolution in Japan based on these kinds of examples. And it, it, it was a complete failure. It was a disaster because the situation was completely different. It's. It, I think it's a little bit rare that people try to directly apply this kind of idea to a radically different context. But when it did happen, it was it was just a complete disaster. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 I do still hear stuff about like, 
I mean, I realize that, that we're now so removed that people don't have any power, but we still have debates about fucking peasants' alliances. Where yeah. are there peasants in the developed world? Like actual peasants, not agricultural workers, but peasants. Oh, I think there's it, peasants in a exist. lot of countries. It like where like like in uh, sub-Saharan Africa. Yeah, and, I, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said developed world though. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, okay. Okay. yeah. Getting stuck on the peasant workers alliance debates in the United States or Canada or Ireland doesn't really okay. make a lot of sense. Oh yeah, yeah. They don't exist. Well, what, it's what? it's a it's a proxy for cl- like cross class alliances between like low rent petty bourgeoisie. It's just that Marxist, like a lot of Marxists, are just lost in history and can't think in in present terms, and they have to relate it to something Lenin said or the, or the historical literature. The CPGB and their work, weekly worker, they've got the bloody hammer and sickle on it. What the goddamn? You know, why should we have the, why should what? there be a sickle in anything now? 3% of industri- of, of American population works in agriculture. Why it left us still have sickles on stuff? It's Yeah, it's and they hard. don't use sickles for sure. <laughs> like- <laughs> Symb- symbols sometimes outlive their original context. I can understand why people throw up the hammer and sickle sometimes, but maybe it's a... It's an impulse we we should probably leave behind. I, I'm all about the red cog. It even that's uh, out of date, really. <laughs> the um, the yeah. CPUSA has that. They have a cog. I know. I've been pissed that they got the cog. I was really angry about that. I was like, oh, come on. You have the only decent modern comic. Fuck you. Yeah. Not only <laughs> they have a cog, they, they have the name. Isn't that crazy? But I think if you uh, want to organize on a world scale, you would you would still probably need to address the peasant question because there's you know like a good major good fraction of the world is still peasants. I, I agree with that, but I think um, right now the there isn't like a communist international, and I think we should probably focus more on our own national context first. You know, like we're, we're too weak to really like what what can we do about peasants you know, in, in the third world at this point. Puya, you're a peasant. That's what I think. <laughs> wow. Wow. Oh, Tom O'Brien. Damn. Problematic. Cancel. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm actually own. probably the only peasant in this goddamn conversation. Let's get yeah, that but <laughs> also you're a math geek. I don't know many peasants who are like reading Kleiman and going like, oh yeah, the single system theory of value. Oh. There's, a of, there's a lot of them out there. I just happen to be their spokesman. <laughs> <laughs> this is what happens when you let an Irishman get sober. Oh, What if Freud said about the Irish, they're the only nation that is impervious to, to uh, what is it? Um, Civilization. Therapy. 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 Oh, oh, like, it worked on everybody except the Irish. They're fucking beyond help. Oh, my God. <laughs> God, that's, that's, that's wonderful. Turn the contempt of Freud. That's tattoo worthy. Um, oh my yeah. gosh. So the, I, the only other point I wanted to, to point out, though, is that this kind of gets up, is, and I'm going to sound politically determined for a second, that McMahon does make a point that like no one actually even looks at the differences between these bourgeois democratic systems, left comms, Leninist, or whoever. Like None of them really like look at their structural differences. For one thing, like, a lot of the strategies that I hear that they're like, you know, let's import Corbynism to the U.S., but like do it in the Democratic Party or whatever. But I'm like, our government's completely fucking different than the British government. Like, it only looks the same in so much that we have a legislative body <laughs> and a Supreme Court, kind of. Yeah, yeah, yeah but the legislative body and the executive are different things here. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's- but, but, but like, it's... I don't know. Like you kind of grab, honestly, there's not like a lot to go on. You grasp at social context. If you don't do like a systematic understanding of your own situation, that what you have are the examples of other places, no matter how remote they are, you might want to just infer that, Hey, copy paste. Let's do that here. Right. I know that's simple minded. This this actually does lead it to where like the fucking annoying Vox liberals are like way more like actually materialist than we are on both our economic and our and our political structures. Like they 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 understand differences that we just don't look like. I mean, materialists. Is is it materialists or is it they just like not disassociated? 
You know yeah, what I mean? Well, like, well, 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 <laughs> like, let's let's ask let's ask ourselves a question though. For example, for example, in the United States, like you hear the Jacobin calls to abolish the Senate or whatever. Why does no one ever talk about collapsing the states? Are dealing with the fact we're a confederation, we're a confederated country, and that historically speaking, if you were going to look at models, we don't follow the same like the the confederated state models do not follow the same patterns as the single as the unitary state models do like it's a difference between i don't know the swiss cantons in sweden and they actually work radically differently there are liberal there are there are liberal like political scientists who are aware of this all right and it also it even affects like economic decisions and shit because of the like we have like a lot of our economics are weird and finding out our tax structure is weird because we have so many weird tax levels yeah this i mean is, yeah, this is stuff that actually matters, particularly if you're trying to intervene in a bourgeois government as a means to building up your strategy. Right. Yeah. Like, like, and I actually appreciate that McNair will admit, like, I don't know. I only know Britain and, and Russia, maybe. But that, I mean, that's actually a really huge point. And nobody, because because the argument that you get from everybody except for the left comms, honestly, is that. You know, X revolution, and you can pick one. It's usually the Soviets, but if it's not the Soviets, it's China. If it's not China, it's Cuba, or yeah, it's the it, or it's the national liberation movements in Africa, which you know they all worked, except none of them did because we are we're going to ignore the time scale of contemporary life entirely. Well, okay, um, that, that, okay, but that's that's the point, right? It's not so much that the Vox liberals are so virtuous; they're just doing what anyone would do if they cared to be in the country they were in and think about social change, right? Like we're just so disassociated that we do a flight from fancy. You know, it's it's just like a way of getting away from our contacts. Right. We're, we're trying right. to actively not grapple with our social situation. It's too painful. It's very it's it's we've been told that we have such an advanced social system, but when you run the numbers, when you look at things, we are very retrograde for for being the kind of economy and the kind of you know culture or whatever that we are but i, I think by also, we i mean united states that's, yeah but yeah. i think that's also Woo. true i mean in a different for different reasons it's true for britain too and when you really look at things here i mean if you like really re like look at things honestly you also have to see that the people aren't being honest about the example societies that they're picking either i mean when you hear like the russian revolution worked how do you say that in a straight face at this point in time like how this is it's it's you're fictionalizing it you're treating it like like an emotional fiction because if you're really loyal to the october revolution i feel like you have to say that it didn't really win right like even though there was like the appearance of victory that that it was ultimately it it did not succeed like it did not achieve his goals even though well, it I mean, displaced it the ruling class Right. I mean, but you're talking about a society that like no, no, matter, no matter what you think the Soviet Union was, it, you don't have you have a particularly brutal form of capitalism in Russia. Now you have a declining you have a decline and it's still declining. Like it's not parse words. It's declining faster than America is. You have a declining political power there. I mean, they just got birth rates back up to normal, like what, like three or four years ago. I mean, like it's 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 crazy. On this episode, you heard the theme tune, the order of the Pharaonic Jesters, and the Night of the Purple Moon by Sun Ra and his orchestra. Thank you for listening, and please join me for the next episode of From Alpha to Omega. This show is a member of the Emancipation Network, a Marxist podcast and research collective. Make sure to check out our network's sister podcasts, General Intellect Unit, and Swampside Chats.